Hey everybody, I hope I got this right, wrong camera, but here I am. Happy Sunday, everybody. Thank you all for being here. Big one today. Uh, and everybody, thank you all for being here. We have audio, I always have to check that. Sometimes I talk to myself for the first minute. But uh, before we jump in, we're going to talk about the Bitcoin Wealth Pyramid. Uh, Patreon member asked for an update on that. We're going to talk about individual decision making. A little career guidance, a little AI, a little chain analysis, a little bit of how you can make your Bitcoin more private. A lot of people are thinking about that. Uh, we will look at Aave versus Uniswap, Avalanche, others, Google, should I sell or should I hold? And uh, a whole bunch more. So it is a, a big, big show today. As usual, 50 nuggets. So, and these are all summarized. We have a member who summarized everything in a great Substack too. Should be a link below for that. If anybody's interested, it is, we make it basically as cheap as possible. Um, but I, I do want to shout out to people who are in Argentina. Uh, they have disastrous economic policies, have had so for a long time. I think President Fernandez down there in a rare moment of clarity announced he will not be seeking re-election. Now, within that, a big, very impressed with that because sometimes there are people in leadership positions that should have left 20 years ago, but they're still there. Ugh. We need new ideas, new blood, uh, younger people, you know, making kind of decisions, especially during this very transformative time. Sorry for dwelling on this, but you know, the reason I mentioned Argentina, that's like the canary in the mine for us all to watch live. Currently, inflation is running about 135%. Interest rates are north of 81%. And uh, how can you, how can anybody survive in that type of situation? Anyway, governments have proven themselves to be the worst capital allocators on earth. And I bet you there are zero government officials watching my videos. Of course they're not. But you guys are better capital allocators. And that's what this is all about. So, the edutainment, as you know. And big thank you to the Patreon community. Pop this up so you can see it. Uh, and I don't c control the agenda of the Q&A. My Patreon does every week. All the top questions bubble up and uh, it typically reflects what's on people's minds. So big thank you to everybody out there. And there are a couple of open seats, but we have a fixed amount and it probably will uh, sell out once the, the bull market starts in earnest, which many people are still confused about. We'll talk more about that today too. So very first question, we don't waste any time here. It is from Big Crypt. What does it take to be in the top 1% and 0.1% of Bitcoin holders? So I created this thing about two years ago called the Bitcoin Wealth Pyramid. I've been analyzing not only lost coins, but who owns all the Bitcoin. And we have a massive model that analyzes all the movements across everything else. And you might hear things like, oh, there's a million people that have a whole coin. But no, 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 no. There are many people that I know have 10 wallets plus, and that's where it gets difficult. And we'll talk more about chain analysis as well in a minute. But the updated Bitcoin wealth pyramid is as follows as of April 2023. And this is the cost to enter the percentile clubs. And remember, last time I did this, um, it was, I think it was about 3.35 Bitcoin to be in the top 1%. Now it's gone up to about 3.6. Bitcoin to be in the top 1%. And note, the top 0.1% also got a little bit harder. Um, and the price, with the price of Bitcoin now at 26K to be in the top 0.1%, you need more than 21 and a half Bitcoin. That's a bit of a coincidence considering there are 21 million Satoshi, 21 million Bitcoins. But uh, the total cost to be in the top 0.1% today will cost you about $600,000. To be in the top half of 1%, it'll cost you $187,000. To be in the top 1% is just shy of $100,000, $99,360 to be there. And the top 2%, 42K. And to be in the top 5%, notice the drop off. To be in the top 5% of all Bitcoin holders, you only need 0 0.153 Bitcoin or about $4,223. And again, back to Argentina, I know Argentina has a lot of people there who are, have been smart enough to accumulate and save in Bitcoin. And when you look at the Bitcoin uh, Argentina chart of their currency, it is bombastic. So this is why we Bitcoin. This is why I started this channel to try and get the word out. Um, but anyway, that's the updated Bitcoin pyramid. And we will update this every three months 
for you guys to know where you stand. Um, next, this is from The Confused. And this is a, a topic that's come up a lot recently. So Trezor has recently announced an integration with coin joins. While it seems like a good idea in masking traceability of Bitcoin transactions, they also seem to be ignoring cries from Twitter about their terms and conditions regarding the ability to approve and deny transactions from UTXOs, which are wallets. What's going on here? And this is, this is a tricky subject. But before I jump into the subject, everybody is trying to obviously become much more self-sovereign, also manage their privacy because trust has disappeared for some strange reason. I have no idea. But from what I hear from where I am sitting, we have lost trust in mainstream media. We have lost trust in banks. We have lost trust in big pharma. And many people have lost trust in their government. And that huge trend towards self-sovereignty, individual decision-making, which we'll talk about later too, is possibly due to people being disappointed by the various sectors that were previously deemed to be trustworthy. So what happens if there's a future where nobody trusts central planners? Maybe we're already here. I don't know. But this is what's going on. And when we see the type of programs that governments are running throughout the world, it's no surprise that this is all happening. You know, anyhow, enough of that. But this is why this question, I think, has come up. So first of all, what is a coin join? Let's jump into this. And sadly, the GIF is not running in this presentation. But normally, you have different routes to get to Z, A, B, and C. So basically, CoinJoin is a privacy method that improves user privacy. And by using CoinJoin, multiple parties can combine their transactions into a single transaction, which makes it much harder to determine which input belongs to which output, basically getting to Z. And there's a number of different paths, and that makes it basically impossible for people to decipher who made the transaction in the first place. And having this integrated with Trezor is actually a good thing. But we'll talk about some of the criticisms and what they're doing. So first of all, they did launch their CoinJoin service, and this allows Trezor users the option to utilize CoinJoins to enhance their privacy. And in my opinion, this is a great thing for Trezor users and the Bitcoin community as a whole. First. The more wallets like Trezor that offer coin joins, the more accessible it is to people and the easier it is for people to improve their privacy. Second, the more people that are using coin joins, the more difficult it is for coin analytics to de-anonymize, therefore improving the privacy of the network for everybody. And this is why overall we believe this is a very, very good thing for Bitcoin. In fact, if you look at the coin join brand is actually very clever the way it's kind of broken up because that's exactly what a coin join does. Now, the question that you pose is, is Trezor controlling your coins? And as for the Twitter criticism that you referenced, I took a look at the Twitter links you cited and it did not find any reference to Trezor approving or denying UTXOs. Um, I also read Trezor's terms and conditions, and there is no mention of anything about Trezor approving or denying UTXOs. And I believe this is a misconception there's still a lot of fake news all around the world, including sometimes on Twitter. And uh, Trezor actually doesn't have any way to restrict access to your coins because Trezor is a self-custody hardware wallet. You hold your keys and hence they have no control over how you use your coins or who you transact your coins with. That is very, very important. In addition, this is their coin join policy. This is an important section that we pulled up uh, and it talks about suspending service, but this doesn't have anything to do with restricting your access to your coins, which again, isn't possible. What this coin join policy is about is that they want to reserve the right to control who can participate in the coin join, okay? And this is probably to protect themselves. Imagine a nefarious government or terrorist organization tried to get access. That could be maybe a problem. But whether this coin join policy is right or not, um, uh, we are actually on the fence about that. And I can see it both ways. On the one hand, yes, this is an effect censorship and you can argue that. But on the other hand, having a good policy for safety reasons and the public good is also fine. Therefore, reserving the right to deny someone the service is censorship and isn't in line with the spirits of open source software or Bitcoin. So yes, you are correct. Now, there are solutions to get around this. Remember, we always try and bring the answers 
So while we are very much against censorship here, and we are pro-freedom, and we are pro-private companies having the right and the freedom to decide who they do business with, if we don't like Trezor and this language in their policy, there's other solutions. Here are just two of them. So solution number one, short term, choose to use another coin join or mixing service. You don't have to use uh, Trezor's coin join. Keep in mind, Trezor's coin join service is optional. Uh, we can use the hardware wallet without using the service. Instead, we can use many other options out there, including Join Market, Wasabi, Samurai Wallet, and many more. And solution number two, more for the long term solution Bitcoin needs a protocol wide privacy on the base layer, such as incorporating CoinJoin into the core protocol or incorporating privacy features like ring signatures and zero knowledge proofs. These external privacy solutions such as coin joints are always subject to third party providers. And it's the third party providers that get to decide who use their service. And the only way to prevent this is for Bitcoin to have its own privacy on the base layer. So let's hope a couple of Bitcoin devs are listening and they can code this in. So a really, really good question. But again, everybody is, is now, it all goes back to trust. Nobody trusts anybody, which is the right way it should be. People should be free to do whatever they want. You know, work hard, pay taxes, and then do with your money as you please, whether it's buy apples or Bitcoin. Next question. And this ties into the first question too, or the second question, actually. This is from Piano Z. The chain analysis capable of identifying both parties of any Bitcoin transaction ever? And if so, does that hurt one of Bitcoin's value propositions, which is anonymity? So basically, net net are Bitcoin transactions traceable. And again, I see where you're all going right now to find it exactly. Is my crypto safe? Can it be tracked? Especially by nefarious parties. So Chain Analysis is a blockchain analytics firm that provides tools to track and trace transactions on the Bitcoin blockchain. And yes, they are capable of analyzing Bitcoin transactions and identifying the addresses involved. But it's important to note, they do not have access to the personal information of the individuals associated with those addresses, such as names or physical addresses. So that is important to know. Mr. Hammer, I see you out there. Thank you. So is it anonymous or not? Uh, in some cases, chain analysis may be able to identify the parties involved in a Bitcoin transaction, particularly if the parties are using known or identifiable addresses. For example, it could be a Binance wallet or something, or if they are engaging in suspicious or illegal activity. However, it's not always possible to identify the parties involved, particularly if they're taking steps to conceal their identities. And we've gone over a number of ways in which you can do that in previous videos. So let's talk about Bitcoin anonymity for a second. It is a complex one in the context of Bitcoin. And yes, they are not completely anonymous, but they do offer a certain degree of privacy and pseudonymity. And the use of multiple addresses, for example, can make it more difficult to trace a transaction back to a single individual. Additionally, the use of privacy enhancing technologies such as coin mixers, like we discussed before, or other privacy focused cryptocurrencies can further obscure this transaction data. And again, while the existence of firms like chain analysis may be limited or may limit the anonymity of Bitcoin transactions to some degree, it is still possible to use Bitcoin in a relatively private uh, manner if certain basic precautions are taken. You know, when you have a Tracer wallet, you can also generate addresses all the time. And we always recommend if you're sending something from, say, Coinbase to your Tracer wallet, fire up a new address in a second and use that. That way you cover your tracks. So not <laughs> not anonymity advice, by the way, I should say. Next question is from Lumux. Um, I watched your video read Uniswap and Aave. Uh, you gave Uniswap the edge due to adoption, even though Aave score is good on the compendium. I bought quite a bit of Aave through the bear market and price action remains flat. Should I wait until the bull run, as that is when they will start to shine, or hop onto a faster horse? So first of all, uh, we do everything here using data and models and numbers, and everything is kind of data-driven, but they're never a recommendation to buy. We just state facts about you know which one has, uh, say, better tokenomics, or better decentralization, or better adoption, etc. But there's a couple of funny things going on. And let's look at both of these right now. So first of all, you are technically comparing apples to oranges. So Uniswap 
is a DEX, a decentralized exchange, and Aave is a lending platform. And they're both very, very different. In addition, the compendium scores are very different. And much of this is driven by one key element. They're actually very similar in many other ways. But here you can see the inflation is 21.2% on Uniswap and 4.1% on Aave. And as you know, I like tokens that have less than, say, 6, 6.5% 6 inflation. Otherwise, you just face a lot of sell pressure, particularly in bear markets. It can be brutal. If there's enough adoption and growth, you can bypass you know, high inflation numbers. But over time, it will bite you. No doubt about that. Let's look at another one that we look at as distanced from all-time high. And both tokens are almost equidistant from their all-time highs. Uniswap is 86.09% from its all-time high, and Aave is 87.34% from its all-time high. And back in, back in the day, a couple of years back, I did have Aave. It was one of the old legacy ones that had kind of good tokenomics, and I felt it was positive. But I do have concerns. So let's kind of summarize, first of all, the two tokens from an objective perspective. The lending platforms. We have analyzed the top five under cryptos in our compendium. And Aave, of the top 20 lending platforms, Aave has the best tokenomics. And this is where it gets really interesting. On DEX platforms, there's 33 DEXs in the top 500 cryptos today. And this changes all the time. Names come in and out of the top 500. But Uniswap ranks 14th out of 33 DEXs for tokenomics. And that is not, not good at all. So Aave still has better tokenomics, but that does not necessarily mean it'll outperform because at the same time, you have to look at other elements like adoption. And our compendium score doesn't focus on that as much. Our SCP score does, which is different. So let's look at the conclusion here. DEXs and lending in crypto are hyper-competitive fields. Okay, and neither of them has strong moats in the crypto industry. And crypto users are known to be very fickle and show no loyalty to any particular platform. They will move from one F NFT platform to another in a heartbeat. And hence, I prefer investments in what I call picks and shovels, which are layer ones. Pick the winning layer one to go forward. Absolutely critical. You could have the best lending platform that's been around for five years, heavily adopted, and then somebody fires up a better one, all the customers will go uh, pretty quickly. I do believe, and I've seen that happen with many other crypto projects. So therefore, uh, from my perspective, would I own either? Uh, no, <laughs> right, not right now. But I, I am also tend to be very, very focused on very, very few assets. And I try to pick the winners, and until something better comes along, I'll stick with them. So hope that helps you. Uh, will Ave make it in the next bull run? It'll probably bounce. Will it get back to all-time highs? I'm not sure. So the next question is from chat. It's from Baker6 regarding ChatGPT. Uh, this is uh, an interesting one and, and really tricky. But since ChatGPT made the news in November 2022, the narrative is humans will be replaced and quickly. But markets discount the chances of Tesla achieving full FSD, which has been making progress through the years of hard AI training. And are these assessments coherent? Please explain what AI is and why it does take trading. So this uh, is a cool question, but it's tricky. So let's, let's jump in. We'll start with the last question first uh, to make sure people are all up to speed and all on the same page. So training is essential for AI because machines cannot automatically perform complex tasks without being taught how to do them, just like a child in school. And during the training process, an AI algorithm is fed large amounts of data in which it learns patterns, relationships, and rules. And this is how it does it. The process allows the AI system to improve its performance and accuracy over time as it learns from the data it's given. That's kind of why these things need a huge amount of processing power and to be fed a huge amount of data to work. Let's talk about Tesla FSD first and why it is very, very different. So Tesla FSD technology uses a combination of cameras, radar, ultrasonic sensors, to collect data about the vehicle's surroundings, which it then processes with an onboard computer to make driving decisions in fractions of a second. And this system uses deep neural networks to process this data to make predictions about what objects and obstacles are in the vehicle's path and how to navigate around them. 
And Tesla's approach to FSD relies on a combination of computer vision and sensor data to enable the vehicle to drive autonomously. And driving is a lot harder than your typical AI that you have on GBT, chat GBT. Uh, so for example, imagine you're curl there's a video of this on, on Twitter. Your Tesla's driving down the freeway and all of a sudden a car flies in the air, a wheel comes off and it's running towards you. The car has to decide in a fraction of a second, does it go left, right, does it slow down, does it accelerate? What does it do to avoid the danger coming its way? That's what it does and that's why it's very different. Now, MLL AI, MLL is for the machine learning life cycle, on the other hand, is a broad, broader category of AI technologies that includes deep learning, reinforcement learning, and other machine learning techniques. And MLL AI is not specific to autonomous driving, but it's used in many applications such as image recognition, natural language processing, and speech recognition. That's it. It is nothing to do with making a prediction about an environment or things that happen in an instant that a car has to react to. That's why I believe Tesla is the number one AI company on earth today because they are so far ahead of what this is. Now, in summary, real quick, <laughs> again, driving is hard, but both Tesla's FSD technologies and MLL AI use neural networks to process data and make decisions. FSD tech is specifically designed for autonomous driving. And MLL AI is a broader category used in various applications like researching a document or summarizing something or whatever else, creating bullets, creating tables, uh, you name it. So it is a very, very different animal. And do I believe it'll have a huge impact on the future? Yes, wait for a section towards the end regarding some career guidance. So next one is from Michael Michael Motorsi. I'm a software developer in my late 20s working for Google. A large portion of my compensation comes in the form of stock and vests every three months. I want to sell some and buy other assets, but not sure if I should wait for the price to rebound first. And would you recommend waiting or hopping on a faster horse sooner than later? So this is one I think about a lot because I have legacy Google from a long time ago. Cost base is very low, but I've grown very impatient. Um, so. I do believe there's a couple of things happening with Google, and I do watch it very carefully. One, it is at an inflection point. They're going through a huge adjustment process. They're going through a lot of one-time off-cash adjustments due to layoffs. I think last round they laid off 12,000 people. I hope your job is still safe and secure. They have also changed their accounting model. They're compressing operating margins for the core business while increasing them for Google Cloud. They want to kind of catch up with AWS, and that would also have components of AI in it too. And the EPS estimates for the company have decreased by 41% from their highs, which is not good. EPS is earnings per share. And there is a lot of negative consensus against the firm right now. And of course, AI is a huge part of this whole inflection. You know, they're changing direction, re-gearing the whole machine. But think of Google as a big, huge tanker. It takes a long time to turn it around. So that's kind of where they are. Let's look at the financials and that 41% what it looks like visually. This is the profit margin getting crushed. The blue is revenue, which has gone up. We're back uh, above Q4 2021 levels. Net income is kind of like the light green. It's going down as a percentage of revenue. And you can see the orange, the most important line is the profit margin is tanking. And that is not good. That's not what you want. Although the growth is there, the profit margin is taking a hit. Let's look at the chart. Uh, this is the the turning around. So even though people were like saying, oh, Google, hmm, <laughs> it's not doing well. It's actually not too bad when you can compare it to other assets. It's only 28% from its all-time high. And yes, it is that tanker. And yes, I do believe there are faster horses. And yes, I still have Google. But uh, I am definitely considering selling some soon or all and moving it to somewhere else. So I hope that helps. Not financial advice, of course, just sharing what I would do. And uh, I think as well, a lot of people are very concerned that Microsoft is going to eat their lunch in the search business. I'm not concerned about that at all. What I am concerned about is how long it takes them to get their profit margins up again. Or will AI change the deal for them? It is already. It's making them completely revise how they operate, which is huge. But just consider... AI not just being disruptive to us, but it's disruptive to a place like Google, who were the kind of, and they were there at the very, very early days of AI. 
um, way back when. In fact, there was an interesting conversation where Elon Musk was working with the CEO of uh, Google and they didn't meet eye to eye and they parted ways. So a little bit of history there. Now, next question is from Roberto Diaz. I have a fair size bag of Avalanche and I'm wondering if I should accumulate more or rather allocate funds elsewhere. What do you think of Avalanche tokenomics and upside compared to Bitcoin, ETH and Sol? Great question. Now, first of all, we're going to look at it from two perspectives. We're going to look at it from a tokenomics perspective and where it ranks in terms of our top smart contract platforms. And I'm glad people are asking much more about tokenomics because it is very important, but it's not the be all and end all. We'll explain why. So first of all, when it comes to their tokenomics out of the smart contract platforms, Avalanche ranks 23rd out of 24. That is not good. Their tokenomics is far from perfect. And that is a problem. However, this is interesting. In terms of their smart contract profiler, and this is not taking into account tokenomics, but it's taking into account things like growth and adoption, technology, etc., developers, all that type of stuff. They are third out of that same amount of players. Now, while tokenomics is an important aspect of a cryptocurrency or a token, it's not the only factor. I have to stress that. A good compendium score doesn't mean it's going to take over the world and win and go up 10x. And a bad score doesn't mean that either, but there is a correlation that drives about 92% of price action, which is tied to the actual compendium score. That is the truth. But does other 8%? Maybe they can sneak through the net somehow. Now, tokenomics, again, as a reminder, refers to the design and economics of a token, including supply, distribution, utility, governance, etc., and good tokenomics can help create a strong and sustainable token economy. Bad tokenomics can make it more difficult for the project to succeed, lack of trust, etc. cetera. Uh, for example, if there is a large supply held within a few key players, that can make things uh, really weird. And I see, I'll make a post in Patreon later today about a token, because I, I now have the ability to sense when things are being pumped, like out of the ordinary, and that tells me they are a scam. So I will make a, a, a word about one later today on Patreon. So you all know, be careful because it's been pumped very hard by a lot of influencers, etc. And it is no good. And I'll prove it. So with that, uh, regarding Avalanche, it's good from a technology perspective, bad from a tokenomics perspective. We'll find out over the next year and a half how much of an impact that has. As a third placed uh, smart contract platform, excluding, of course, you know, Bitcoin, ETH, etc., just the rest of the rest, it's not bad at all. But will it be held back by the poor tokenomics? This has been an interesting one to watch. Um, next question is from Avocado. Uh, listen to the data. This was a key point of your video, how to master the mindset of crypto and investing. If you missed that, it's probably, some people say it's the most important video I've ever made. I'll add it here afterwards. Um, but I find that it's easy when I'm home and focused on TA. But in social situations, I find myself failing, for failing to capture to, or falling capture to the group think, i.e. bad psychology of trading you warn about. How do you stay steadfast, focused, data-driven, and confident when hearing opposing views with great passion and conviction, especially from your friends and family with stubborn beliefs, and stave off emotion and fear? This is probably, <laughs> probably the best question I've ever had. Thank you so much for asking it. Um, I think if I had spent my life listening to others, I would be both broke and dead. Okay? A simple fact. And I learned that in my 20s, not kind of, you know, we're still we're still far from perfect, but literally to kind of blaze my own trail. If you listen to groupthink and consensus, mathematically, you'll always be behind. That's why I'm not a big believer in things like sentiment, because if everybody's talking about the same thing, you're already too late. So that's that's kind of my take. So first of all, you did mention TA. You look at TA first and investing solely. I'll repeat this again. I've shared this once before. Investing solely based on technical analysis is not recommended because it considers past price and volume data, but it does not account for fundamental factors such as financial health, market position, industry trades, whale movements, etc. TA can identify short-term trends and trading opportunities, but it may not provide a complete picture of the 
token or a company's long-term prospects. And relying solely on technical analysis can also lead to overtrading and failure to identify important market events or sentiment shifts. That is so, so important. Combining technical and fundamental analysis is, however, the secret sauce. And that is what I do. So use FA to decide what and TA to decide when. It's that simple. Okay, but never, ever, ever rely on TA alone. You need to always keep your head out the window, find out what's going on in the world. <laughs> Please remember that. Uh, let's talk about how you blaze your own trail and how I do it. First of all, conduct your own research. Rather than relying solely on the opinions of others, it's important to conduct your own research. I always say, um, if you are investing something, research it like you're going to marry it. Okay, do your due diligence, do your background research, etc. And, and, you know, build an analysis independent of others. This can help you avoid being swayed by the opinions of others and help you make more informed decisions. Classic example of that. Uh, if, you know, we're back in November, October, November 2022, if you'd listen to the sentiment on Twitter and listen to others, you'd still be sitting on cash. And that's just the reality. So again, do your own research. Build data-driven models, absolutely critical as well. Get comfortable with modeling, get comfortable with planning, get comfortable with setting goals, absolutely critical. Don't listen to anybody unless you're very, very, very smart. I, am a, I have a very narrow list of people that I listen to and trust, but most of my own information comes from me. And also seek diverse sources of information. This means diversify all the information you get from everywhere. Even listen to people that are, say, for example, bears. Listen to their theses, just in case they actually have uh, something that could spark a, a new idea. And it's important to seek out these diverse sources of information and opinions rather than relying solely on a single source or a group of individuals that might be, say, bullish, for example. And this can help you gain a broader perspective and avoid, again, being influenced by narrow viewpoints. Also, challenge assumptions all the time and consensus views. Don't be afraid to challenge assumptions. Uh, critical thinking, first principles thinking, and questioning can help you identify potential flaws or biases in the prevailing wisdom. Um, and then stay disciplined, avoid emotional reactions, leave your emotions at the door when investing and researching. Uh, this can be a major driver of groupthink behavior. And uh, sticking to a well-defined trading plan and avoiding impulsive decisions can help you stay disciplined. And finally, keep learning. Never stop educating yourself. Never stop. Be like a shark. As soon as a shark stops swimming, boom, game over. Think of swimming as learning. And uh, <clears throat> always develop a deeper understanding of the markets and make sure you make those informed decisions. And that is basically it. <laughs> it sounds like a small list, but literally... Uh, Build your own frame of mind. Get deep. That's one of the reasons I look at so few assets, uh, because I look at so much. Now, one of the reasons I look at so much macro is because that determines where things are going. And we'll talk more about that in a minute, too. So hope that helps. Actually, I, one example I did include here as an example of groupthink. So if you uh, fire up YouTube and you look at all the thumbnails, if you look, say, stock market or crypto, you'll see all the thumbnails with flames. You know, the world is going to end, it's Armageddon, etc. Uh, S&P 500 going into recession. Oh, consensus views say we're all going to die. But no, they were way too grim and they too much of a recession factored in. And many of them were wrong. People thought Q1 results 2023 would be terrible. And folks still don't get what I've been stressing, banging my head on on the table for months and months now, is higher inflation, raises revenue and earnings. And this is what you see here. So this chart is black, is the companies that beat, 77% of all companies beat earnings expectations. Okay, uh, the pink is those that missed about 20% and about two or 3% met expectations. But the point is, the easy way to look at this carefully, I added two red, a red line and a green line. One is, um, Obviously, the trend was down up to Q3. Q4, it turned around and Q1 was way better than expectations. I think there was a Bank of America strategist as well, Savita Subramanian, if I got that right, are considering whether their 2023 EPS target 
of $200 on average per share for the S&P 500 is far too low, given the strength of the results in Q1. They're thinking of adding another 10% to that to take it up to 220 a share. And again, be ahead of the curve. When, like, you look at the people on CNBS and all these other finance channels, they all have this group thing. They all think the world's going to die. I've never seen such a negative sentiment in their life. But again, maybe it's just they pump fear because fear sells. Maybe if I have a flame and a thumbnail, I actually thought about it for two years now, adding a flame to a th thumbnail and having my mouth open and seeing if views would increase. <laughs> but I'm not going to stoop that low ever. But anyway, that's just my take. So great question. Do your own research, blaze your own trail, don't listen to others. And if you do, make sure they're very smart, very experienced, and are right most of the time. So next question is from CoinFit. Uh, what is the best master degree to learn in investing, uh, MS in finance, data analytic, analytics, or computer science? Uh, due to personal reasons, I have to do a master's and I would like to do something that is going to teach me investing since it's what I like. And it's what I'm spending money on. So CoinFit, looks like you have to do it. Uh, I, I personally believe nowadays with all the tools we have in our hands, you can learn yourself. But if you want to go to school, that's fine. Let's look and a quick reminder of what all these three are and where the disciplines are and which ones can benefit you. One, Master of Science and Finance. It's called an MSF. They're called different things all around the world. But you get an understanding of financial theory and markets, which you get here in this channel. You cover topics, corporate finance, investing management, financial modeling, and risk management. Financial modeling is very important. Risk management is very important. And this can be a good choice if you want to work in areas like banking, asset management, and corporate finance. Second one is Master of Science in Data Analytics. This master's degree is for learning, etc. But, you know, focusing on developing skills in data anal analysis, statistics, and machine learning, uh, etc. I spent a lot of my life, by the way, learning things like statistics, model building, um, data analysis for decades. Very, very important skill. Well, I'll get back to that in a minute. And the third one is computer science. Um, this really, you know, when you think about providing a future a foundation in computer programming and software development, I think it's very, very important. I couldn't do what I do today without the software developers in my team here. And, it, you know, I have the vision, but they, they have they have the hammer and the nails to knock it all together. I, it's way beyond mine. So from that perspective, I think it's very important uh, to build investment models and algorithms. And it can be also useful if you're interested in working in areas like quant trading, algo trading, high frequency trading. These are all things. So quick summary and I'll be blunt here because I don't want to steer you down a dark path, but this is not educa education advice, but I do believe AI will impact all three, particularly the last two. All right. The last two as a reminder are this one, the data analytics and computer science. However, the one that is most likely the most going to be the most impacted will be data analytics. You can now point an AI engine at a stack of data and it'll analyze it for you better, faster than you could ever do yourself. I think that whole area is toast. Uh, if you had to pick one, um, I'd go with the masters of science and finance because there are skills like model building, which you talked about earlier, are going to be very, very important as you go forward. And finally, before we open up some live Q&A, Helping Animals favorite piece of the week, we donated to the Wild Spirit Wolf Sanctuary to help support the care and shelter and medical needs for River Fox and other animals. Uh, River celebrates her fifth birthday today, April 23. Coincidentally, same birthday as K8, our mod in the chat too. And she likes apples. I wonder does K8 like apples too? Uh, and her donated fur beds and bird watching. Happy birthday, River, and happy birthday, K8. Very cool. So I hope you enjoyed that show. That was a lot we went through very fast, but so many core, core important things we all need to know. Now, questions from you guys out there. I wonder what the topics will be today. Kiwi Robin, thank you so much um, for helping our furry friends and happy birthday, K8. Thank you, Kiwi. Mike, St. Jude needs us. Just want to say thank you for all the members and do. Oh, <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, Mike. But I was hoping for a tough finance question. Uh, one Brightham, 
Uh, as a complete beginner, what should I focus on learning first in TradingView? Uh, feel kind of lost, uh, so much to learn. Check out, I have a whole playlist, technical analysis stuff. I go through kind of the core 10 indicators you need to know and why. Start with those um, and then look at some other good YouTube videos online. But I, I kind of break it down and tell you exactly how to configure and use and interpret the data from those models. Um, I'll add that playlist below, but go to the old stuff. The old is gold, as I say. New stuff has changed a lot, but you can't. I don't like repeating the same thing over and over again. Um, also, um, German girl in Florida, fun question. How many meals do you have in a day? And have you ever tried one meal a day approach? I'm studying it due to my husband's recent autoimmune disease. Oh, sorry about your husband, a uh, German girl in Florida. I hope he gets well soon. But a lot of autoimmune diseases can be cured with good diet and, of course, a little bit of exercise. I typically eat twice a day. I eat at 12 noon if I'm not doing the stream, and I eat at 6 p.m., and I fast for 18 hours a day, and I've been doing that for years, so... I, the one meal a day I can do because normally the lunch I have at 12 noon is actually the IA blend, <laughs> which is a, a mix of seeds and grains and vegetables and berries. Um, and that's just, it's just like a liquid drink. So even after drinking that, you're still kind of hungry sometimes. Um, and then dinner is kind of like a full meal. So that's what I do. One meal a day, you could say I kind of do it, but not really because I do have that shake at 12 noon. So hope that helps, but uh, I will post it actually. I'll post some of my things as well again on Patreon. I've got a whole list of videos I've made around blends and shakes and morning hydration drinks and that type of stuff. Uh, I'll post them again to make sure you can recap. Deep Random Thinker, any chance you could do a deep dive in Cuspa? Yeah, it just it's one of those things that is just being pumped very, very heavily now. But I did look at it. I'm going to just go and pull up something real quick because um, I always have to check, make sure it isn't a secret treasure. Um, hold on one second. Well, I got to go fire this big monster up and pull it up. But I have looked at it. And again, going back to... Everything we've heard, uh, clear, hold on, clear, get to do, 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 hang on, Boop. sorry about this delay. Yeah, it's, 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 <laughs> it, it's, it's too small and too too obscure and in too much of a competitive field with far from perfect tokenomics. So um, I'll have I'll have a look, but I can't promise you anything. And remember, if it's pumped hard, it's no good. And everybody is kind of pumping Caspa. And I know the chart has gone up quite a bit too, but part of that is because how much it's been pumped. And I will make a post about another one later today that I'm seeing as being pumped very hard. When people tag me and saying, oh, he missed this one, then you know it's a scam. Uh, Fitpola, I am still down on Tesla, even though dollar cost average when it was lower. Going lower, it's hard to say. The, the, the market is irrational, but over time, this thing is going to go a hell of a lot higher. In yesterday's video, actually, I covered um, the ARC uh, projections, their average projection is $2,000 in the next four years. And that is like 1,500% return, 15x. And even if you take half of that, it's a seven and a half x So when, you, when you're investing in things like, like I'm I'm underwater on Solana and I've been investing in it from, from over two years ago, uh, but I'm getting close to being above water. But sometimes you just got to hold through DCA if you see crazy extraordinary falls. Like I bought Tesla last week. Um, I bought, I added quite a, quite a big position because as each day goes by, as I learn more about all of their revenue streams and their progress and how they are literally breaking the competition, it makes me more bullish. And as Elon Musk says, 
spring 2024 is going to be incredible. What that means basically is they will have ramped up all their gigas. They'll be operating at very high levels of effectiveness and efficiency. Their margins will be through the roof. Their energy business will explode in growth. It's growing now 360% um, and their energy storage business. So, and, and Elon Musk also said, most importantly, he believes they could nail FSD by year end. If that happens, <laughs> like I don't even want to think where the stock could go if they can enable robo taxis and stuff. But think, you know, don't let this slight downturn hurt you. Markets are irrational. Listen to the Wall Street analysts talk about Tesla. And that shows you how clueless they are. Nobody gets what it is. And I know you might think I'm a Tesla fanboy, but if you look at what they did uh, on the 20th of April with that uh, big, massive rocket, putting it 34 kilometers into the sky, um, pretty, pretty darn impressive with something that size and that weight. It's never been done before in the history of mankind. And they're going to launch another one in three months. So hold tight. This is one you stack. You know, that I, I was chatting with somebody in Discord earlier this morning. I said, Tesla is the stock of the century for us. There will be no other stock like it, in my opinion. And Bitcoin is the disruption asset of the century as well. So those two combined are just very, very special. Love them or hate them. Uh, just be patient. Wait till early 2024. If you see prices down like 170, it could hit 160. I don't think it'd go below 160, to be honest. And if it does, that's when you start looking behind the couch for coins. <laughs> so hope that helps. Uh, Carl Bornhorst. What well, stops Satoshi from creating Bitcoin 2.0 with another 20 million coins or someone else for that matter? Nothing. Carl, great question. It's been done before. Look at Bitcoin Cash, BCH. Look at BSV. Uh, I forget, I don't even remember what BSV stands for, but these are forks. These are versions of Bitcoin. So that Bitcoin 2.0, Bitcoin 3.0 already exists. But what matters is adoption. That's why I always stress adoption. You could have the best whatever in the world, the best fun park, the best restaurant, the best, you know, crypto protocol. But if nobody adopts it, if nobody trusts it, there's nothing. And that's a big part of what we just discussed today as well. So Carl, that's happened multiple times. And again, there's only one Bitcoin. It'll be very, very hard. Try, try to replicate the security of Bitcoin. Think of it all the, all the ASICs rigs around the world that are plugged in, keeping this thing secure. It's impossible. <laughs> yeah. Well, nothing's impossible, but it's highly unlikely. And I thank you for your super stick as well. Scoobs25, KN, Jeff Hammer, AC1, buy all. Enjoy the weekend. Get out there, get some fresh air. And uh, I'll post those things as well later today. So thank you all for the likes and the subscribes on the way out. And also, don't forget to follow me on Twitter as well. I give notifications because sometimes people don't get notifications from YouTube because I'm shadow banned. But I do post on Twitter always 30 minutes before I go live. So follow me there. Um, I'm the guy with 140,000 subscribers on Twitter. And I also post some fun stuff there too. So thank you all. Have a great weekend. See you tomorrow. Oh, by the way, DCA tomorrow, 7.30 a.m. Pacific. I think it's 4.30 Stockholm time. It's going to be on CTO Larson's channel tomorrow. And I'll see you all there. We're going to have myself, CTO Larson, Ivan on tech, and Scott Melker as well. And maybe Ran if he's not traveling. I think he's, he's on the road somewhere. But uh, thank you all. Have a good night.